All right, I stopped sharing just for a second to say hi to everyone. And uh, thank you very much for uh, coming to the first seminar of our seminar series on uh, microbiomics. Um, I, I, I'm very thankful for uh, your interest and I hope this will be somewhat useful to all of you. Uh, and now I'll start uh, sharing my slides again and um, uh, uh, we will uh, start. And those of you who are joining us uh, through YouTube, uh, thank you also for your attention. And uh, I apologize for not having more room in our Zoom meeting. Hopefully, uh, uh, people will be so tired of it by this week. Next week, there will be much more room. Um, OK. So um, my name is Meran. And uh, this is uh, uh, an online seminar series on microbiomics, uh, especially for beginners. Today, we have a uh, very full agenda. Um, this is our program for today. Uh, next few slides will take us through the lecture logistics. Uh, I will try to give a sense uh, to you about who uh, you are and who are we and how we're going to do this before we start talking about uh, uh, actually microbes at all. So today, um, uh, more than 2,000 people registered to this meeting. And uh, uh, we are a very uh, uh, diverse crowd. More than 80 countries are represented in this meeting. And um, uh, basically, we're a very diverse uh, group of people. 43% of us are graduate students. But the, 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 those who registered for this meeting include science writers, editors, startup founders, biology teachers, medical doctors, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, a large fraction of us are microbiologists. But the, the meeting also includes those who are computer scientists, engineers, biochemists, oceanographers, nutritionists, veterinarians, et cetera. So uh, uh, the point I'm trying to make is this particular beginning will be uh, 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 doing its best to give something to everyone in this meeting. Uh, most of you are going to be familiar with some of the topics we're going to be discussing much more than I am. And uh, yet I'm hoping to uh, not leave a lot of people behind by going in depth into certain uh, technical or biological phenomena. So again, just to reiterate what was written on the blog post, the main purpose of the seminar series is to introduce some of the key concepts and computational strategies behind popular omics approaches. These strategies include genome resolved metagenomics, pangenomics, phylogenomics, microbial population genetics. We are going to discuss these things and uh, we will do our best to keep things uh, as simple as possible, but without trivial, uh, uh, trivializing these concepts. Uh, omics is very complex. Uh, so in times, uh, at times you will feel lost, but I'm hoping that uh, we will recover it, uh, uh, recover from that uh, with further discussions at the end of our seminars. Each session, for now, we scheduled for six week, uh, weeks. We can extend it with additional seminars, but. Uh, the current plan is each session will have a seminar part, which is going to be about an hour, and a discussion part, which is going to be about 45 minutes. So uh, I will do my best to make sure that if you leave after the seminar part, if you have more important things to do, uh, you will have a good handle on everything that's covered, uh, uh, even if you miss a discussion. But this week is an exception, because uh, this week, the seminar part will take longer than an hour and probably we're not going to have a, a very long discussion uh, session because the, the topic is uh, very deep and I want to uh, go through these things um, carefully. Seminars will not cover tools or best practices, uh, but the discussion part will be led by your questions uh, every week and we will discuss things as a community. So if it comes to a point where everyone wants to know about a tool or uh, uh, collect opinions about people's experiences with the approach, then uh, uh, we will discuss them. But seminars will not cover tools um, and simply focus on conceptual aspects of microbiomics in general. So I, I'm hoping that uh, you are going to ask questions and engage in discussions. We're using Zoom. And uh, the, the problem is uh, we're 500 people right now in, in the Zoom meeting. So basically every second is, uh, is taking minutes when you think about how much time goes by uh, uh, for, from everyone's lives. It's like being near to a black hole. The time works differently for the Zoom meeting. Therefore, uh, it's going to be difficult to uh, uh, let everyone unmute themselves and ask questions. But I'm hoping that you will find this button under your Zoom screen, which will open the chat window. 
if you promise that you will not uh, uh, waste too much time there. And you will be able to ask your questions uh, on the chat window. So those questions, uh, I'm sure there are going to be uh, uh, members of this community online right now who, who, who will answer them. But we have at least one person, Eva, who is a graduate student uh, uh, at the University of Chicago. She will do her best to try to answer your questions. And, uh, and uh, if necessary, she will interrupt me and raise the question to the entire uh, audience. And during the discussion sessions, uh, checking, uh, clicking this uh, button will open the participants window for you. And at the bottom, you will see this little gesture. So you will be able to raise your hand and uh, then we will unmute you and then you will participate in discussion by asking question or, or making a point. Hopefully during discussion sessions, we will use chat window and, uh, uh, and, and this feature of Zoom effectively to really uh, get everyone's input uh, as much as we can. At least those of you who have uh, things to say. Um, and Maren, also, one, sorry, yes. one thing before you continue. Uh, a question from YouTube is, can you in increase the volume, please? Increase the volume. I don't know if how to do possible. that. I can get closer to my microphone. I okay, hope, maybe uh, that will help. Yeah, Emily it will, will let me be know. easier uh, on your end uh, if you try to increase the volume, I'm afraid. Um, thank you, Eva. Okay, so uh, those of you who are joining us from YouTube, uh, um, we would like you to also participate to this meeting somehow uh, by through a feedback from YouTube to the meeting environment. You also can use the chat window on YouTube to ask your questions. And there, Emily will, um, will do her best to respond to your questions. And if necessary, she will relay those questions to the Zoom environment. And then we will uh, try to answer them from here. But uh, please note that there will be about 10 to 20 seconds delay between uh, the Zoom stream in YouTube. And this, this is not only for this week, in the following weeks as well. So I am here talking to you, but uh, of course this uh, uh, kind of event is not uh, uh, very easy to put together. So I was lucky to get a lot of help from different people. You already heard about Eva and Emily, uh, but there, we will today, for instance, hear from uh, Roland uh, hudson Fitchler. He's an uh, assistant professor at the Montana State University. He will tell us about uh, some of the shortcomings of everything we're talking about, how some of the things we will be covering are not going to be enough to study microbial life. So uh, a, a word of warning, uh, we will listen from him. And Mike Lee, uh, a research scientist at, uh, at NASA, he is going to join us in one of the following uh, weeks to uh, talk about phylogenomics. Uh, he will join to, uh, into that conversation. And I got a lot of help from Jessica Fussell, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Chicago. She patiently made sure that uh, things I'm about to tell you are not absolutely uh, 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 incorrect. So th the meeting also is uh, thanks to the uh, contributions of Simon Foundation and Alfred uh, Sloan Foundation. Uh, I'm funded through uh, these uh, uh, foundations and that's how I can uh, make time for these kinds of uh, free events. And um, CDAC, Center for Data and Computing at the University of Chicago, uh, was extremely helpful to find out how to even send more than 500 emails to so many people. Because once you hit the 500 uh, mark, even Gmail says you cannot send that many emails. So when I promised you that I would send out the emails 15 minutes before the meeting, I had not anticipated that there would be more than perhaps 300 people. And then I had to learn uh, how spammers actually work. Basically, I'm using a system uh, what uh, marketing agencies use to email, uh, bulk email people. So CDAC really helped me uh, catch up with those kinds of um, uh, up-to-date knowledge. All right, okay. So this is all the logistics. We're done with the logistics. So <clears throat> we're going to start with uh, uh, the part of this seminar where I will try to convince you that microbial life is important and interesting and uh, hopefully I will be able to offer an answer to the question, why do we even care? So most of you do not need to hear these things. I'm aware of that. But uh, we have uh, uh, undergraduate students, high school students among us. And uh, I want to uh, go through these things before we start talking about actual omics data types and uh, strict computation strategies. So we are on the same page. I will first start uh, with the most general things we know about microbes. Uh, 
I will put out statements and then try to justify them. And then we will go into uh, the most interesting part, the diversity of life. Um, uh, so let's start with this one. Microbes were the first life forms on earth. So um, uh, this is a true statement that we do know uh, that this is the case. And, um, and um, uh, here, here's basically how, how it went for our planet. The universe has already been around for about 9 billion years. And then the earth has formed. This is about 4.6 billion years ago. And at the time of uh, its first formation, uh, it's not necessarily a habitable planet. But over time, uh, uh, it cools down. And um, uh, uh, a billion years go by. And uh, the first life form appears on the planet, a bacterial organism that can use the energy from the sun to create biomass. So these organisms uh, were photosynthetic, but uh, they were not necessarily using uh, oxygen yet because you need to realize that the planet at that point did not have any oxygen. It was a very different uh, place back then, clearly. So um, these organisms were doing uh, uh, anoxygenic photosynthesis uh, and uh, it takes another 700 million years for the first oxygen producers to emerge. We still have them around and uh, basically their respiration yields free oxygen is a waste product. And um, so basically these microbes start generating oxygen uh, through uh, photosynthesis, but oxygen doesn't immediately start accumulating in the atmosphere because uh, um, uh, it, it's basically chemically captured by other elements on earth that were abundant in the environment that are not oxidized. For instance, iron it was one of them. Uh, when um, dissolved iron uh, uh, oxidized with oxygen, it sank to the bottom of oceans. How do we know that uh, this great oxygenation events? Now we can look back the uh, uh, rock formations and actually learn about that. So imagine oxygen is being released by these new life forms and then it's immediately uh, captured by, uh, uh, chemically captured by free elements like iron. And then these dissolved iron that's oxidized sinks. Uh, it's no longer uh, uh, dissolved. And, uh, at the bottom of oceans, it creates these uh, uh, astonishing layers of iron formation on rocks. So now we can go back and see the evolution of uh, the, the, the chemistry of the atmosphere by looking at these rock formations. So uh, microbes worked under these uh, circumstances for another 400 million years. And 2.3 billion years ago, basically the atmosphere had oxygen, thanks to their uh, uh, efforts, basically. And this was one of the most fundamental things that happened on earth to uh, facilitate more complex organisms, more important, larger organisms to be able to evolve. Because uh, compared to other forms of uh, uh, energy production, the ability to oxygen uh, as an electron acceptor was a huge uh, uh, change. It's basically switching from steam engines uh, uh, running with water to uh, gasoline. Uh, so now um, uh, larger forms of life could evolve. And uh, then we saw uh, first ter terrestrial plants about 500 million years ago. Uh, all these things were happening in the oceans, of course. Uh, and then uh, life uh, emerged in terrestrial ha habitats. And um, then first mammals emerged about 200 million years ago. And for instance, one of us made us all us proud by learning how to fly. And they uh, uh, immediately proceeded to uh, solve all the crime on earth. And then uh, the, the, the branch of life that is currently uh, represented by humans uh, emerged. This happens 10 million years ago. And about 400 years ago, humans may, made the first observation of microbes through simple microscopes. So when you look at this entire uh, uh, time flow, you realize that um, how much of this planet and life on it depended on uh, uh, microbes. Without microbes, there would have been uh, no life. So another statement that, uh, that you, you may hear uh, very often uh, when microbiologists are talking to you is uh, uh, the fact that microbes still do a lot for the planet. They sustain the habitability of uh, this planet by catalyzing chemical reactions within global biogeochemical cycles. This is um, uh, it, it, it mouthful, but uh, basically what this says, uh, uh, microbes, uh, the functioning of this planet is on the shoulder of microbes that makes planet livable for much less skillful organisms such as ourselves. And uh, the way I uh, look at this often is, uh, goes like this. The number of elements and their quantities on Earth do not change. 
except for ra radioactive decay and you know uh, we uh, the stuff we send to space and never get back and meteors that crash on earth the number of elements and their quantities is pretty st uh, pretty stable stable so we somehow must use and then recycle and reuse all these elements to create different forms of life and uh, the flux and recycling of these essential chemical components of life and their overall bioavailability is largely on microbes. And um, this is true for a lot of uh, elements on Earth, but one of the best examples to microbial services is um, the cycling of nitrogen. So nitrogen is pretty important from the biosynthesis of DNA to amino acids, proteins to cellular structures, nitrogen is one of the most essential building blocks of life. While 70% of air is nitrogen on Earth, you may be like, oh, life did a good job choosing Earth because we have a lot of nitrogen in there. Uh, that nitrogen is not bioavailable. Uh, uh, the, in its gas form, uh, nitrogen is not accessible to the vast majority of life. That's why you are breathing in, breathing out, despite the fact that your body needs a lot of nitrogen to function, none of that nitrogen is uh, uh, leaving any trace, any, any influence uh, uh, as it goes through your lungs. So you're not able to make sense of nitrogen, but you're not al alone in this. Many other eukaryotic organ, uh, none of the eukaryotic organisms that are alive uh, can, can make sense of nitrogen. So uh, uh, in fact, uh, many essential processes in uh, natural habitats are nitrogen limited. Primary productivity in the ocean is nitrogen limited. Uh, everything uh, that's going on, uh, uh, everything life does is nitrogen limited. Taking nitrogen from the atmosphere and putting it in molecules so nitrogen is accessible to other organisms or reclaiming nitrogen from recalcitrant waste products of those organisms after using uh, nitrogen uh, as a function of their metabolic activities uh, for its recycling is entirely on the shoulders of microbes globally. So the entire nitrogen cycling on earth is taken care, care of by microbes. Now humans also uh, uh, influence it dramatically now, but uh, essentially uh, this is uh, one element that we depend on uh, microbes uh, dramatically to uh, have it available and distributed globally. In, of course, microbes also contribute to uh, the, the, uh, the amount of oxygen maintained in the atmosphere. So, uh, but apart from that, the global cycling of carbon is also heavily influenced by uh, microbes. So when you look at the uh, carbon cycling, you realize that ocean microbes are responsible for the uptake of uh, a large fraction of excess carbon dioxide produced by our activities. Um, you, you keep hearing about this and uh, uh, we put out too much carbon dioxide and uh, the earth somehow has to deal with that to reduce the influence of this uh, green gas uh, on, on the climate. And, and, and uh, terrestrial plants play a role, of course, but ocean microbes uh, uh, do, do a lot uh, to maintain the, uh, the, the balance. Well, uh, just to put this in uh, uh, some context, each year we release about nine gigatons of uh, excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through our activities. And uh, then um, uh, about three gigatons of this excess carbon dioxide is taken up by terrestrial organisms. Terrestrial photosynthesis takes care of it. In marine habitats take uh, about two gigatons of excess, uh, excess carbon dioxide uh, at the cost of ocean acidification. And um, you may say, what happened to the remaining four? Well, it, it's, it remains in, uh, in the uh, atmosphere and that's why all the debate about climate uh, and, and, and the warming of the planet in general. Okay, so uh, uh, another thing that, that is uh, a true statement and you will hear a lot is the fact that microbial life is extremely abundant and extremely diverse. When I uh, uh, think about this, uh, I often realize that uh, the, the term abundance is very easy to communicate. When I tell you there are about 40 million bacterial cells in a gram of soil, a million of them in a milliliter, milliliter of fresh water, you can extrapolate uh, these uh, numbers to quantities of soils and uh, waters on earth and uh, you immediately would realize it doesn't even make any sense to try to imagine how abundant microbes are. So there are a lot of them. And maybe uh, something that's a little uh, uh, easier to comprehend is that each of you harbor approximately one trillion of uh, one trillion microbial cells. And basically, the number of microbial cells that live on your body is almost uh, equal to the number of eukaryotic cells that make up your own body. So, as many of your cells you have on your body that, that makes basically uh, 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 enables you to function and exist. Uh, there's, uh, uh, there are microbial cells that live on you. 
So you're basically a, a, a microbial uh, ecosystem. Uh, you are covered by microbes on your skin, in your guts, and uh, in your oral cavity, etc. So microbes are truly abundant. Uh, not that we are ever probably going to be able to wrap our minds around these uh, sheer numbers, but they are very abundant, and it's relatively easier to communicate. But when it comes to uh, uh, talking about the diversity of microbial life, as in uh, um, uh, the degree of variation among life forms, then it starts to become very difficult to explain to people immediately. So um, that's why uh, I assigned an entire chapter in this uh, uh, meeting right now to talk about the diversity of life. And, um, and I hope so far I gave you a little bit of an understanding of why microbes are important for the functioning of the planet, how they initiated life and continue to sustain its existence on this planet. So let's now uh, uh, think a little bit about uh, what do you even mean by diversity? So life is one of the most interesting phenomenon in the observable universe. Uh, I, I think uh, most of us would agree with that, uh, uh, with that. And being challenged with the astonishing diversity and beauty of the members of life, humans must have started wondering about the systematics of life quite early. What I mean by it is uh, some people at some point must have uh, uh, asked themselves how many different kinds of beings uh, 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 living beings are, are there? Uh, I'm sure this is a very ancient question that perhaps outdates even first human languages, uh, thinking about how to make sense of this entire diversity and probably will never ever uh, going to be able to learn uh, uh, the history of this question, but there is a name that managed to come um, all the way uh, today as the first person to attempt to classify all living things in a systematic fashion. Uh, the first taxonomist or first biologist person. And that is uh, uh, Aristotle. Uh, I like this uh, uh, Frisco by Raphael because um, I always feel like here uh, Aristo is doing, doing his postdoc with uh, Plato, uh, which took about 20 years. So uh, it's a long time he spent in, in the school of uh, Athens. And um, uh, the, the beauty of this image is Plato uh, in his platonic way is showing up the heavens and uh, probably asking uh, what you think is up there. Uh, Aristo gestures earth and probably saying in my uh, imagination, how about we first understand what's down here? And that's what uh, in fact uh, he, he, he did. Uh, um, fortunately, they both enjoyed a very successful life, well-founded research, but uh, Aristo put a lot of effort uh, into uh, thinking about how can we classify things, which I think in retrospect is, uh, is not necessarily a very um, uh, achievable goal, to classify life into fundamental units so we can talk about its diversity. But he, he did try uh, and he, for instance, I took the screenshot from Wikipedia. Uh, you can see that he basically identified some features of uh, organisms in general and tried to basically categorize them. Uh, those with blood and uh, without blood and there's uh, a mineral iron here obviously does not have blood, the, uh, how many legs a given organism or entity uh, 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 he ran into his, and uh, soul, uh, whether they had soul or not, uh, and uh, uh, whether they were rational, sensitive, or vegetative. Uh, I like that humans are all of them. Uh, basically, <laughs> we can be vegetative and rational at the same time, and some qualities, etc. So he did create, basically, a, a very uh, early forms of taxonomy. This is, uh, of course, fascinating in many ways. And um, so you, you realize that humans must have been asking uh, this question for a very long time. And 2,000 uh, years go by from uh, the days of uh, Aristotle, and uh, this is where we are. For instance, this is uh, a paleontological chart by Edward Hitchcock, 1840. And here he is essentially trying to represent uh, the diversity of life somehow by uh, dividing uh, uh, life into two major groups, plants and uh, animals. And uh, at the top of plants, uh, uh, there is man. Um, and at the top of plants, obviously there is uh, palm trees. Uh, uh, equally relevant, you know, putting palm trees at the top of plants is as relevant as putting man at the top of uh, uh, all uh, animal life. And uh, here's another attempt from Ernst Haeckel, uh, Evolution of Man, uh, these uh, sexist times. And uh, he also uh, attempts to uh, uh, 
uh, to, to, to try to classify organisms based on how, how relevant they are to each other. So from these, you can see that the notion uh, uh, of life is basically a branching uh, bifurcating uh, tree that, that some things are more similar to each other than others, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, it's, uh, it's the, both of these images communicate that. So uh, basically when you look at this tree in a very crude way, you can start imagining how the diversity of life could be represented in this form, uh, right? So you can, if you have many branches or distinct uh, tree-like structures uh, for one planet versus another planet, you can talk about how, uh, uh, you know, diverse is one compared to the other, etc. So all these attempts aside, uh, one person uh, managed to create, in fact, a framework of thinking. And it was uh, Charles Darwin. This uh, beautiful image, which says "I think," is uh, is one image that still survives to this day and uh, continues to influence our way of studying the diversity of life. And we will talk about this much more during uh, our session on phylogenomics. And we will create trees uh, that that kind of uh, we will discuss how we create trees that kind of look like this essentially. But here, the the point is that uh, uh, certain members of uh, existing members of life are more similar to each other uh, and, and likely coming from a, a, a common ancestor uh, than uh, others, although those others can have uh, other members that are similar to them compared to other things. So it, it creates a framework to think about this. And at the time of Darwin, microbes were known, but, uh, 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 but, but mostly these uh, attempts to think about how can we uh, uh, classify life, going back to these uh, examples especially, relied upon morphology. So in order to, for instance, put this branch next to this branch, uh, Ernst Haeckel looked at the animal, looked at the plant and said, okay, these have equal number of legs and they both uh, 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 are cute. So they must be cats or, uh, and then in another branch, he put together uh, dogs with coyotes and wolves, for instance, in another branch, zebras and donkeys uh, and, and horses went together. So. Uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, for a long time, our, uh, um, our desire to identify fundamental units of life, to be able to talk about its diversity, relied upon uh, observable morphologies of uh, uh, members of life solely. We didn't know what else we could do. And of course, uh, this uh, entire framework fell apart when people uh, found out about microbes, one, two, they were not as rich in their morphologies as the rest of the life was. For instance, these are two very distinct microbes and I hope I'm going to be able to communicate to you how distinct they are from each other once we have an agreement on, uh, on, on, on how do we study diversity, yet they look identical. So then for instance, imagine uh, what would you do if you had observed all these microbes? Would you put a single little branch here that describes all microbes? Because in comparison to morphologies out there we observe, uh, microbes are not going to be able to uh, uh, show their true diversity. Well, maybe people at the beginning thought that uh, this microbe must be identical to this microbe, but it didn't go uh, very long because we realized immediately, uh, with the, uh, thanks to cultivation efforts, that uh, microbes actually behave very differently, things that look identical. So we now have this uh, problem solved to a large degree. So now we actually have a framework to uh, discuss the diversity of life altogether. And uh, I, I want to walk you through the major steps, in my opinion, uh, of how we got there. First, this, this guy, uh, Antonio van Leeuwenhoek, uh, uh, first uh, observed microbes. It was 400 years ago, and uh, he, uh, uh, he basically initiated microbiology in a way. He took, uh, a, he was working on very simple microscopic devices, optical devices that can serve as a microscope. And he essentially collected some samples from his uh, oral cavity uh, plaque. And then he uh, uh, realized that there were things that were swimming around and moving around and they were definitely not, your plaque was not necessarily uh, 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 absent of life. So it was filled with it. And he described it. And uh, here, in fact, uh, this, this particular drawing uh, represent some uh, bacterial organisms and uh, uh, publishes this paper and uh, uh, etc. And then uh, a, a long time passes by and Robert Koch, uh, along with his contemporary um, 
Louis Pasteur. Uh, I'm sure those of you who are from France are hating the way I pronounce it. I apologize. Uh, with Pasteur actually uh, started to bring microbial life into the lab environment. So um, uh, through cultivation that, uh, you know, imagine people had been uh, uh, seeing microbes in the environment, but uh, bringing them to the lab environment to ask very specific questions to microbes, such as how much temperature can you deal with? Or um, uh, what do you look like when you are given this nutrient or that nutrient? Uh, measuring their growth rates, etc., was a significant uh, step towards uh, uh, understanding microbial life better. And um, uh, Koch is a pioneer of uh, medical microbiology, and he brought many microbes into lab environment uh, through this strategy. He, uh, uh, basically from this spawned uh, new theories about uh, microbes on, uh, uh, on human life, etc., And uh, things got very fast uh, after the pioneering work of uh, Rosalind Frank Franklin that, uh, as you all know, led to the discovery of the structure of, the, of DNA. Now, when people realized uh, uh, that, uh, that there was this genetic structure, uh, a common cookbook, if you will, that was shared by all living cells, Of course, that brought a, a, another dimension to all these studies, trying to understand the diversity of life, etc. And um, then uh, Frederick Sanger, who uh, contributed, uh, uh, who made major contributions to the sequencing of DNA, um, allowed uh, people like Carl Woese uh, to discover genes that can give us highly resolved depictions of the diversity of life. So basically, imagine you have all now you are able to you first recognized that there are uh, uh, organisms of all sizes that contain this genetic structure that we call now DNA. And then you can actually learn about its content by sequencing. So what is next? Uh, you're reading something that's written in a language that you, you have no idea about. This is like finding all these cookbooks all around and then trying to uh, uh, understand which kitchen may they belong. So what uh, Carl Woese did was to discover something that was uh, actually common to all genomes, uh, all cookbooks, and this recipe could be relied upon to understand how diverse uh, different forms of life from each other by comparing their sequences. So in a, in a way, this was essentially finding, um, let's say, how to make a bread recipe. Regardless of uh, where you are in the world, regardless of uh, what kitchen you're uh, uh, studying, there was such a recipe somewhere And it was relatively easy to detect it uh, in these uh, uh, cookbooks uh, that we uh, kept reading through sequencing. And finally, uh, um, uh, he identified those genes. In another way, uh, uh, perhaps a slightly better analogy is um, uh, the ribosomal proteins, uh, the ribosomal RNAs, I apologize, Carl Woese ended up using to study diversity of life are like engines of different kinds of vehicles. You find, uh, let's say you're an uh, alien, you came to earth, and you're looking around and realizing there's a diversity of um, cars and trucks and tanks and snowmobiles and all sorts of things. And uh, as an alien, you're, uh, you're interested in classifying them into a, a tree-like structure. So you know which of these uh, 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 vehicles go which, uh, 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 with which others. But morphologies are so distinct, you, it's very difficult for you as an alien to uh, find out how similar a snowmobile Uh, to a Honda Civic, because uh, Honda Civic has tires, the other one doesn't, et cetera, et cetera. But then imagine as an alien, you discover that there is this thing called the engine. And engines, the way these vehicles produce energy, are always present. You pretty much know where to find it in the vehicle. And um, the properties of engines do not so dramatically change. So you may have pellets or tires, but your engine still uh, abides to uh, very simple principles. So the discovery uh, uh, of ribosomal RNAs that form the ribosome in living cells, which is the, uh, 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 the organelle that is responsible for protein synthesis, hence extremely essential, was uh, a turning point in our understanding, in our ability to put life in all members of it, except viruses. I'm not saying viruses are not a part of life, but uh, 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 in the same context. And this is the tree he, Uh, uh, put together that now for the first time, perhaps using, uh, 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 certainly for the first time using ribosomal uh, RNAs, putting together uh, all members of life into a single tree. Uh, 
So now, uh, uh, the, the major uh, finding here was uh, life was not only prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. Uh, he, he could see that there's a distinct branch, the placement of which is uh, uh, not certain, uh, and this tree is definitely not representing the most up-to-date understanding we have. But the salient point here is he could see another branch of life that was not bacteria, that was not eukary uh, uh, eukarya. Uh, uh, in its existence. So that's when we retired the term prokaryote uh, uh, and realized that uh, there is more to it than just uh, uh, a single clade of life. So now I'm going to show you a version of this tree to communicate to you the diversity of life a little better using a much more recent data coming from fully sequenced genomes. And this tree is essentially put together uh, using uh, the same uh, principles that uh, uh, Carl Woz uh, relied upon. And this tree will complete a circular tree, uh, uh, as you can imagine by just looking at it perhaps. But here, the, this particular branch represents all mammals. And you may say, why are there, are there five mammals? There are much more mammals on Earth than five. We know that. Uh, and it is true. Uh, there are much more than five. But essentially, um, uh, you wouldn't add more mammals to this tree to increase its resolution. So basically, uh, we're selecting some uh, uh, representative genomes in this case to represent mammals. These are well enough for mammal representation because you will not any more branch lengths if you include more and more genomes. You will just uh, uh, make your tree much uh, harder to digest. This branch now uh, shows you all animals. So when I say all animals, already, uh, you have um, um, uh, a lot of microscopic organisms here, like water bears, for instance, that you don't see. Um, and here contains entire eukarya. So basically you have everyone you know, every living organism you have interacted with, and including uh, algae, fungi, protozoa, everything uh, is represented by these branches based on how different their engines uh, uh, were from each other. So basically, when we take out all the engines and look at them, uh, this tells us that uh, this is uh, how much diversity there, there, there is here uh, with respect to uh, uh, the engines we find. So this now shows you archaea, archaeal diversity. And uh, the rest uh, of this uh, uh, tree shows you the bacterial diversity. So now this is an astonishing uh, uh, image, in my opinion. And it's actually almost impossible to comprehend, I think. Uh, I stopped trying uh, uh, to understand what does it really, how to really wrap my mind around it. But I want to share it with you a little uh, anecdote so you can uh, uh, think about it yourselves later, perhaps. So this fish is here, and this is where we are. And essentially, this is the genetic distance. You should add together these solid lines, one after another, to have an idea about the uh, distance, evolutionary distance between these two uh, organisms. And uh, there is some difference uh, indeed. But then here is the microbe I showed you before. Uh, this is where uh, this guy is, and this is where the other one. And uh, when you look, when you ask the same question, how distant are they from each other, you see these branch lengths. And, uh, and then uh, you, I hope you think about how uh, uh, you don't feel like a fish today. And uh, the, the problems of fish is, uh, they have to deal with is very different than uh, uh, ours. Yet, from an evolutionary standpoint, we, uh, compared to these uh, bacteria, in fact, we share the same engine. We are uh, 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 basically the same sorts of beings uh, compared to all the other microbes out there. So just imagine uh, if uh, Aristotle was alive uh, and realizing this. I think he would have stopped at that point uh, uh, asking the question, how many different kinds of organisms out there? Pretty much this is it. Uh, uh, you realize that life is taking place uh, at the microbial level and uh, probably we are never going to be able to actually uh, uh, do what uh, our uh, ineptitude in a way, trying to classify everything into uh, fixed bins, creating a final tree of life for everything that's not moving around. It's probably never going to be possible. Microbial life is extremely diverse and extremely uh, uh, fast in its pace uh, of evolution. But uh, so, what does this diversity mean? Uh, and, um, and, and how, yes, Iba. Sorry, uh, quick question from the audience. What does the outer layer represent? 
Oh, that's a great question. I, in fact, yesterday night going through these slides, I wanted to take a look at that and uh, I realized I had more important things to do. So I don't know. Uh, maybe, yeah, I shouldn't speculate. <laughs> I was going to make something up, but uh, there are too many people uh, uh, to make things up. Okay, uh, I apologize for that. I'll find out and I'll, uh, I'll post it around, okay? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, so, okay, uh, this, in fact, the, 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 the lack of uh, distance in our engines here and the, the tremendous amount of distance between almost every other microbial organism manifests itself with respect to how much of uh, the earth we can occupy, actually. So while uh, both the fish and you essentially stuck in similar comparable uh, regimes of oxygen and temperature, et cetera, microbes are uh, uh, basically uh, uh, taken over the entire planet by being able to adapt themselves to many different uh, environmental conditions. Just to give you an idea, for instance, you can find microbial life uh, thriving from 15, uh, minus 15 Celsius or four Fahrenheit to 130 degrees Celsius or 266 Fahrenheit temperatures. So uh, I'm not saying just being able to survive, but actually thriving, uh, uh, living in these conditions uh, uh, effectively. Uh, and uh, you will find microbes from 0 per, uh, point to 12.8 uh, 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 point pH uh, acidity. And um, you will find microbes who can sustain uh, 2000 uh, uh, atmospheric pressure, you will go four miles down into the uh, uh, Earth's crust and you will find microbes and you will go six miles up in the atmosphere, you will find microbes and um, you will find microbes that can survive up to 5,000 gray radiation. And um, 5,000 gray radiation um, does not make immediate sense, but basically uh, uh, five gray radiation will kill a human being uh, uh, within hours. Uh, the reason it will kill a human being within hours is because the high energy particles that, uh, that leave uh, the radioactive uh, uh, substances in crazy speeds will shatter through your tissue and DNA and basically uh, uh, force your cells to cease uh, to, to function. And of course, the same thing is happening to microbes as well. They also have DNA, they are under the influence of these uh, uh, environmental stresses, but uh, those microbes that can sustain this much uh, uh, radiation are much better at DNA repair than, than we are. So uh, they still are able to uh, continue with their um, uh, uh, presence in these environments that we cannot go. Well, just to point out the fact that uh, not all microbes are able to do all these things, but what I'm trying to communicate here is that there is at least one microbial population that we have identified that managed to uh, uh, put these numbers on this chart. So uh, that's what I mean when I say the diversity of microbial life is very high and they are able to occupy many, many distinct niches. So in a way, when you think about it, uh, microbes define the limits of life on our planet. They, uh, uh, by filling every possible niche, they determine the boundaries of life. So if there is no microbial the environment, there is no life there, you can be certain. But there are many environments you will find with no eukaryotic organisms or large organisms such as ourselves. So essentially, I think the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, if, if you wish to understand life, uh, uh, you cannot ignore uh, microbes. Microbes um, have initiated life on this planet, uh, prepared the planet to be able to support more complex forms of life like ourselves and they still sustain the habitability of this planet by recycling essential nutrients. And with their diversity, they basically are the ambassadors of life, carrying it to even most uh, uh, impossible corners of this planet. I'm sure they would love to do it uh, in other planets too. Just they are waiting for NASA to put its game together. And uh, so uh, in a way, uh, uh, I, Microbes are the owners of this planet. They, they were here before us and they will likely uh, be here uh, uh, long after we're gone. I had taken this picture um, um, uh, while I was at Yellowstone. Basically, I, um, only days after I was discharged from a hospital in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, where I was uh, almost dying from a bacterial infection. I, I was infected by a, a strep uh, strain and um, everything went to hell. And I spent a couple of days in the hospital and I came back to Yellowstone after I was uh, uh, 
out and I sit in this spot and I was looking at this uh, um, place called uh, Grand Prismatic, uh, this is, uh, Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone. Uh, it's the largest uh, hot spring in Yellowstone National Park and the third largest in the world. The temperature of this pool you're looking at uh, ranges uh, from 63 degrees Celsius to 183, 87 degrees Celsius. It's pretty hot. And I think this captures uh, exactly what's going on on Earth uh, as of today. You see that this, um, uh, this pool is surrounded by eukaryotic organisms only from a distance. They don't get any closer than this. You see all the tree line and everything. Uh, the reason to that uh, the high content of mineral is making life miserable for plants so they don't grow uh, in these regions and yet you can see these beautiful colors uh, of uh, microbial mats these are microbes that are able to occupy all the way here and into the pole in fact so uh, the water comes from the depths of the earth being warmed up by uh, uh, lava uh, uh, etc and it comes up as uh, sterile this is one of the few uh, places on earth where you actually uh, find uh, sterile uh, water, sterile environments, naturally occurring, Yellowstone. And, uh, and as this water goes up, it probably uh, has long forgotten about the existence of life on this planet, is met by the first uh, organisms that are able to survive as soon as the water reaches to a certain temperature regime. They are there trying to penetrate deeper and deeper constantly uh, uh, to, to basically uh, carry out the word about life to everywhere. There are these uh, um, um, uh, thermophilic organisms that are able to deal with temperature there. And then you see humans uh, walking by with their technology that enabled them to visit these places, but uh, there is no way we can survive, of course. So uh, this brings me to, uh, to the final point I want to make about this, uh, thinking about how uh, uh, microbes are able to uh, exploit this planet so beautifully. Uh, uh, reminds me of uh, this, this person, uh, Carl Sagan, who I think put together one of the most amazing sentences uh, uh, in English language. Uh, we are a way for the universe to know itself. So we basically are extensions of this universe, you know, borrowing all these materials and putting together these bodies and, uh, uh, and, and can think and look back and, and understand the universe itself. So Basically, we are an extension of the universe to be able to look back and understand the universe. So we are, of course, uh, 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 that's why this is, I, I find it so profound. And I, I cannot help but think that if uh, we're applying this to life and microbes, uh, uh, indeed, microbes are a way to, uh, for life to understand itself because uh, microbes, uh, compared to what they are able to do with life and uh, how uh, on this planet, we basically are uh, merely a hitchhikers to, uh, to, uh, to this phenomenon. So I hope so far I've been able to uh, uh, convince you that uh, microbial life uh, is uh, interesting, important to study to understand the past uh, and the future of our planet and to understand our well-being as well. And uh, now I want to talk a little bit about uh, how do we study microbes via sequences uh, and um, and then I will uh, finish by telling you a little bit about uh, the omics data types we will cover and why are they different than uh, other strategies of studying microbial life. And then uh, Roland will uh, uh, give us a word of caution. So how did we start studying microbes? We studied microbes through cultivation. We first started bringing in uh, microbial organisms from uh, natural environments. And we tried to understand those natural environments and their makeup by looking at the things we could cultivate from them. It's like, imagine uh, you are an alien and you want to understand uh, different planets. So you set up these traps for humans to walk in. And when they walk in, you capture them, you bring them to your uh, uh, spaceship and study them. And now you did it for another 10 planets that we don't know about, but they do. So they are trying to look at these uh, humans that walked into their traps and then try to make sense of uh, the, the environment and the planet. Of course, not everyone is going to walk into those traps. Right. So um, uh, let's keep that in mind. Uh, first, that, uh, that the cultivation uh, is a biased strategy in many ways, but that enabled us to first uh, start uh, looking into uh, uh, environments uh, from a perspective of microbes. What microbes do, are we able to capture and grow on our uh, uh, laboratory environments? So this, what you're looking here, this is anthrax. This is the first ever photograph of uh, uh, bacteria and published by uh, Robert Koch uh, uh, when, uh, it's, it's 
1877. And uh, this is amazing that I found this uh, on uh, uh, the website of Koch Institute. There's a PDF and I put the DOI here so you can actually read it if you want to. Uh, uh, don't worry about copying the link. Uh, we can send it later if you're interested. So uh, in this PDF, there's literally this image. This is the first photograph. I was so shocked that, uh, to see that on, according to Google Scholar, this document uh, was cited 45 times. Just to keep in mind, citations don't mean everything. Uh, so, um, uh, and cultivation, bringing bacterial populations from their natural environments to our lab environments, still an ongoing uh, thing in microbiology. Uh, it's very commonly used. In fact, just to prove that point, I went online uh, yesterday night uh, while I was doing final bits of this presentation um, and uh, asked online uh, uh, whether my microbiologist colleagues could send me their favorite uh, pictures of bacteria they grow today in, in the lab, uh, in their labs. And uh, for instance, I, I got this one from uh, Emily, um, uh, a, 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 a microbial organism that's uh, a growing in her, her enrichment culture. And then uh, multiple other people responded and uh, look at these beauties already. Um, um, and then multiple other people responded. So I started to uh, get more and more responses and then there were more and um, uh, actually there were even more. So uh, when you look at, uh, when I look at this, first of all, I'm astonished by the beauty of uh, these microbial cells that we don't see with naked eye, but uh, when we bring it, uh, them to our, uh, um, um, lab environments, we can observe their beauties in isolation. So bringing microbes to lab environments, still uh, a very uh, viable strategy to study microbial life, but it's not necessarily representative of the diversity of microbes in nature. So remember the tree I showed you and uh, uh, microbiologists quickly realized uh, that uh, uh, trying to grow microbes in the lab environment does not necessarily help them uh, exhaust the diversity of microbial habitats by those members that they that, that can grow in lab environments. So, uh, and uh, there is this, for instance, study from um, uh, 1985 that talks about uh, um, uh, the great plate count anomaly that uh, where people realize there's a large discrepancy between the viable plate count and total direct microscopic count of bacteria by several orders of magnitude. Some uh, uh, say that um, only 1% of microbial life uh, uh, typically can easily be grown in lab, in lab environments. Of course, it's difficult to uh, assess the accuracy of uh, 1%, but probably uh, it is really uh, uh, around there and communicating the fact that not every organism uh, in the environment will uh, easily grow in our uh, uh, labs. Uh, in theory, anything can be cultured, but in practice, uh, microbiologists had been struggling dramatically to uh, culture anything. So, um, uh, but we still, we have learned a lot uh, about microbial diversity through sequences of these microbes that were able to grow in, the, uh, in our labs because the, the amount of growth, growth enabled us to uh, recover enough DNA to be able to learn about their uh, sequences. But then um, uh, a, a dramatic change, uh, a turn of events uh, took place once people realized that Carl Wolz's engines he identified, the ribosomal RNA uh, genes, could be used to amplify small bits of information from uh, environmental genomes to have fingerprints about microbial life, to think about its diversity in a given environment. So I'll just give you a quick uh, overview of that approach. So microbiologists, uh, environmental microbiologists could go to an environment uh, to survey the diversity of environmental microbes through 16S ribosomal gene sequence uh, uh, amplicons. They could take a sample from there. They could extract the DNA in that sample. And then they would do this step called PCR amplification uh, um, to amplify a small region of all genomes in the environment that were information rich. So we could then understand uh, uh, what taxon these microbes uh, belonged, for, inst for instance, what taxa were in the environment by sequencing only those small fragments. And um, uh, another convenient thing about these small fragments were they were short enough to be sequenced effectively with our uh, uh, accessible sequencing machines. So sequencing uh, is uh, a process where you try to make sense of a, 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 a information in a piece of DNA, 
but uh, uh, the current high throughput sequencing technologies um, uh, are only able to characterize uh, a, a small number of bases. Let's say 300 base pairs with current Illumina uh, sequencing technology is pretty accessible. But when you want uh, to know 10,000 nucleotide long uh, uh, fragments, how they look like, then you need to go to different technologies that are just emerging, like long read sequencing technologies uh, today. But it was quite convenient to use existing uh, sequencing chemistry to make sense of uh, all these data by sequencing. So once you hit these small fragments, like some small fingerprints per bacterial uh, population, and uh, uh, high throughput sequencing of these fragments gave all these sequences, and then people could uh, either cluster them de novo based on sequence uh, similarities within a given environment, uh, or by relying on uh, 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 reference databases to ask the question. Uh, so I have this question, uh, I have the sequence, which genome does it uh, uh, match best? Uh, and, and then you could assign a taxonomy to the sequence. So this strategy, in fact, uh, was extremely affordable, extremely easy to perform, uh, and still is, uh, uh, by the way. And uh, the data it produced was uh, uh, remarkably easy to analyze. So uh, when these three things came together with the interest of uh, uh, microbiome, things exploded, basically. And uh, uh, especially people realizing that they are covered with microbes, reinventing the fact that they are covered with microbes, which was known for uh, a, a very long time. And now they could study these microbial populations and characterize the diversity really led to uh, a, 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 an explosion in uh, the field of human microbiome. So for instance, this is a quote from uh, Eugene Chang, a professor at the University of Chicago from one of the reviews. Uh, Over the years, we and others have come to appreciate the gut microbiome as a microbial organ, as important and essential as uh, any other organ uh, of the body. Not surprisingly, anything that causes uh, malfunction of the microbial organ will have far reaching impact on uh, other systems of the body. And we do know how microbes can influence our well being from those that are already pathogenic, uh, identified as pathogenic microbes, et cetera. But uh, the, the notion that most of the non communicable recent uh, uh, diseases that we observe have something to do with uh, uh, bacteria initiated uh, uh, a large number of efforts to understand to what extent microbes uh, 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 influence our well-being and uh, uh, health outcomes. Of course, this hype uh, um, led to uh, this immediate interest and in, in huge uh, amount of uh, effort to better understand uh, human microbiome, led to a lot of studies that are not necessarily um, uh, doing a fair job uh, at accurately depicting uh, the roles of microbes in, in, in disease states. And um, what I would like you to know that uh, uh, many people have heard about uh, human microbiome uh, from um, news articles and uh, uh, probiotic companies trying to sell down things, et cetera. But uh, in, in the domain of science, those who are studying uh, microbial life had a lot of concerns about this, including Gene Chang and others. So one of the people who uh, was very outspoken about uh, the, the, the hype in human microbiome was Jonathan Eisen. Uh, Jonathan Eisen is a professor at the uh, uh, University of California, Davis, and um, uh, uh, he, he's, he's a proponent of open and accurate science, and uh, who also coined the term phylogenomics that we will cover in a, a few weeks. Uh, he, he has done a lot of uh, 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 attempts to uh, raise public uh, uh, understanding, public awareness about uh, what's going on uh, uh, in the microbiome field, with his now uh, famous Overselling the Microbiome Award. Uh, 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 so he would give you the, one of these beautiful stars if you manage to oversell the microbiome. And in fact, um, uh, he published many, many, this is just a subset that Jonathan Eisen was so kind to send me, uh, one of uh, a subset of the things he published. But when you go through these things, from poop doppings to trying to convince people uh, um, uh, that, that microbes will make them uh, 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 less likely to develop strokes. Um, he found all the incidents uh, of, uh, of not necessarily so complete signs in the expense of uh, upsetting uh, his colleagues. And that's the difficult thing, of course. When we complain about these things, we often inadvertently uh, make our uh, colleagues upset. Uh, what I would like to point out is that 
everyone uh, did these studies and uh, tried to raise awareness about their existence uh, uh, with all the good intentions, but perhaps we are uh, 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 overestimating the relevance of microbes to disease, uh, uh, except those cases where pathogenic bacteria are causing disease. So in a way, I think Roland will point uh, 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 out this is a, is, a, is a warning statement, but I always feel like so far what has been done uh, in the field of human microbiome is not so different than we went all these houses and took all the chairs out and those chairs that were coming from houses on fire look different than those chairs that came from houses that were not on fire. And um, uh, uh, so there are associations, but to what extent microbes uh, drive our well-being is uh, still an open question. And for Jonathan's uh, 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 excellent work, you can visit uh, microbiomania.net uh, to see more examples of, uh, of, of his uh, uh, overselling the microbiome awards and, and read more from his blog. So while all these things were taking place, people were going, um, uh, many, many research groups and uh, agencies uh, investing into human microbiome and other microbial uh, investigations through amplicon sequencing, there was an undercurrent of uh, science that was emerging. And, uh, and that science is represented not in uh, uh, news articles as frequently as uh, those uh, micro microbial uh, uh, remedies that will help you uh, not feel bad after uh, 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 it, it, an episode of disease, but uh, they are um, definitely changing uh, textbooks uh, uh, as we speak largely relying on uh, omics data. So uh, these studies, instead of using amplicon sequencing, uh, they use uh, uh, more comprehensive ways to study environmental uh, uh, microbes. Uh, I'm not saying better on purpose because uh, uh, all these approaches have their place, uh, but uh, omics approaches are taking an in-depth look in the expanse of complexity of data. Uh, you know how I mentioned that uh, uh, ribosomal RNA uh, surveys are cheaper, uh, they are more affordable, they are easier to analyze, they are uh, easier to prepare. Uh, omics analyses are often uh, uh, very difficult and uh, takes uh, a long time to analyze, takes uh, a lot of effort to deal with the data. But um, fear does not help uh, us when, uh, if our purpose is to understand microbial life. So that's why you are all here. That's why you heard about microbial omics and uh, you want to take a step at that. And I think it is very doable. Uh, uh, it's just, uh, it requires the appreciation of the complexity beforehand, so you are not disappointed later. This, these things are uh, not as uh, straightforward as uh, 16S uh, ribosome gene amplicon analyses. So the most things you know about microbiome uh, uh, are done uh, via uh, uh, approaches that will not probably help you a lot if you are interested in uh, questions that uh, relate to microbiomics. So essentially, um, uh, I think this is an amazing time to be a microbiologist and a life scientist who can speak omics. And, uh, and this is why there's, there's a lot of interest into understanding omics. And uh, during the next five weeks, we are going to go through multiple of uh, these omics strategies to discuss underlying principles of, of these approaches. Like what are the uh, key points one needs to understand to be able to make best use of uh, the tools that are available for microbiomics essentially. But just to uh, uh, um, put it in context, basically what the data that goes into microbial omics, if we want to compare it to the previous slide, uh, is uh, it starts the same. Uh, we call it an environment sample, and then we extract DNA or RNA, actually. Uh, and then we stop right there. We, uh, do high, we apply high throughput sequencing strategies to this entire content of genetic material, whether it's RNA, whether it's DNA, and, um, and we try to characterize uh, environmental microbes by looking at uh, the entirety of the genetic uh, makeup of a given habitat. Of course, as you can imagine, uh, our PCR primers that identify those recipes in the cookbook to learn about the diversity of uh, cookbooks in a given environment uh, does not necessarily give us any insights about uh, 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 things that they don't recognize. So for instance, in an amplicon sequencing study, you do not find plasmids or phages, or in most cases, eukaryotic organisms. But when you do uh, sequence the entirety of the uh, genetic content of an environment, then uh, you uh, run into all sorts of members of life. 
uh, including viruses. And, uh, and that, that uh, makes things very complex, but also uh, uh, very promising you know, and actually a lot of fun uh, once you have a moment to uh, get your head up from uh, the frustrating computational tasks in front, of, in front of you, you realize how much uh, you have learned actually. So um, what are these omic strategies? Um, uh, here's a quick summary of uh, the most common uh, ones. There are many more, but uh, all are familiar with genomics, the study of uh, 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 genomes where you identify functions, perhaps metabolic pathways, you look at sequence, and com uh, sequence composition or other properties of genomes. And uh, one of the terms that has been uh, uttered a lot recently is metagenomics. And metagenomics essentially is the entire genetic, entire DNA content of a given environment. So in this case, your data includes many, many genomes, well, one or more genomes, let's say, and, and many, many uh, genomes from complex environments, and they are in a mixture. So that's what metagenomics is. And two weeks from now, we will discuss how metagenomics can be used to reconstruct genomes from metagenomes. But I'm not going to go into that uh, now, uh, yet this is the strategy uh, by which we can uh, have access to genomes of environmental populations to uh, uh, start making sense of their functional potential, their population structures uh, through microbial population genetics, et cetera. So this is one way to bring population genomes into uh, on our computers without having to cultivate microbes. Another way to bring uh, genomes uh, uh, into uh, uh, our workflows without having to cultivate microbes from the environment is single cell genomics, where uh, microfluidic strategies enable us to capture individual cells and then use uh, uh, specific amplification strategies to get more of their DNA and then sequence them. And once we start accumulating genomes uh, from the environment, the next thing you want to answer is to what extent are they similar to each other? How do we compare these genomes to each other? So when people sequence the second E. coli genome, of course, they wanted to understand, uh, given all the genes in the first E. coli genome and the second E. coli genome, how do they compare? And this led to the emergence of uh, a, another omic strategy called pangenomics, uh, a comparative genomic strategy that enables us to put the entire uh, gene pool uh, 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 into a single framework. Uh, so we basically pull together multiple genomes and look at the entire gene pool and ask the question, how these genes distribute across different genomes? To be able to uh, infer uh, the, the structure of uh, how they how these genomes relate to one another, given the gene content, and we will talk about that in three weeks. Then, uh, you while pan genomics is very applicable to closely related genomes, genomes that are similar to each other uh, uh, are going to be uh, good with pan genomics because they will have a lot of shared genes. But when we're talking about distant genomes and try to understand an evolutionary uh, 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 context for them, then uh, we rely on phylogenomics, which is uh, a strategy that, for instance, yield, uh, that yielded the tree I showed you when I talked about microbial diversity. And uh, we will talk about it in five weeks, uh, actually, uh, and, and the un, uh, uh, key aspects of phylogenomics. Then uh, these are all DNA, but one can also uh, generate uh, RNA, uh, uh, recover RNA molecules from the environment, just like the way we're doing it uh, uh, for DNA. And metatranscriptomics is a way to understand microbial uh, activity patterns uh, um, uh, in the environment. Very challenging, just like everything else, but uh, doable. And uh, in, in, in one of these weeks uh, after pangenomics, we will also talk about metapangenomics, linking the pangenomic uh, uh, context, our evolutionary understanding of how these genomes relate to one another, to their ecology through metagenomes in a systematical fashion. So, these are not all omics strategies out there. For instance, I did not mention proteomics or uh, metabolomics. Um, there are many other omics strategies, but these are the primary ones that we use uh, 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 through uh, DNA or RNA uh, sequencing. And um, as I mentioned, the next few weeks we'll uh, uh, discuss these approaches in greater detail, and we will uh, spend an entire hour on uh, multiple of them. But now I, I want to stop. Here, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, say hi to you all uh, without the uh, screen. And then uh, let Roland uh, uh, tell us uh, um, his reminders about what we are not going to learn by just doing sequencing. What are we missing? I, I think this is very important uh, 
to um, make sure we have uh, the right expectations and uh, right warnings from the get-go. While sequencing switches are uh, very uh, um, easier to uh, 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 do, they get much more credit than uh, what they are good for. So uh, Roland will help us wrap our minds around uh, uh, this. And um, thank you very much for being with us, Roland. Go ahead. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Marin, for inviting me. Um, so what I want to do is provide a small cautionary tale to remind us that all the methods scientists are using are inherently flawed to a certain extent. And ideally, we should you know, not only use one method at a time, but combine different methods with each other. They are complementary and use the benefits of each method and then combined learn something new about the world. And so what I wanna to do today is to talk specifically about some of the inherent problems of DNA sequencing without going into the technical details of why that is, but more about how we as scientists need to conceptualize some of those problems and be constantly aware of this um, without going into too much technical details. And so the first thing I want to mention is that DNA sequencing alone is, is next to meaningless. You need additional data often called metadata um, that can inform your study. They can provide context. And one of the best examples for this is, is the human genome. So what, this, what you're looking at here is basically a metabolic map of the reconstruction um, of the metabolic pathways as they are predicted from the human genome. So after we've gained the human genome, you know, we look which genes are encoded, what are the metabolic pathways um, that the, the human can do. And if I look at this map, and would not know anything about the human, about its physiology, about its anatomy, about the environment that humans live in, I would predict that humans can ferment. And what this means is I could suffocate a person and they would still be able to live. And we all know this is bullshit. I cannot put a plastic bag over a person, right? Humans are not yeast. It is correct that under certain very specific conditions, humans can ferment, right? If you go for a run or you exercise a lot, parts of your body, the muscle cells that are exercising, that are engaging in, in, in you know, high activity will, round of, will run out of oxygen. So the oxygen supply from the blood cannot sustain the oxygen demand of your muscles. The muscle cells switch to fermentation, they produce lactic acid, and this is what causes you know, your muscle pain, which only later goes away once the lactic acid is transported away um, to, to your liver. So if we would know these conditions, right, that under certain very specific conditions, specific cells in the human body can ferment, we would, you know, make a very different conclusion about the organism, about the physiology, the metabolism, the habitat this organism lives in, um, than if we would just look at the genome sequence alone. And so keep in mind, the only reason we know that is because we obviously know where humans live. If we apply the same approach, you know, just blindly sequence an organism's DNA or many organisms' DNA out of an environmental sample and then make wild speculation about the organisms, some, not all, but some of these conclusions will be, will be wrong. So we need context, we need additional data to, you know, interpret genome sequence data. The other problem is that we do not know, we know a lot about you know, which proteins, um, or, you know, what certain proteins actually do um, in living organisms. However, even in the best understood organisms on the planet, Escherichia coli, so the, you know, the lab rat of microbiology it is called, we do not know what about 17% of the proteins are doing. This is not going into the details about all the other things that are going on, right? So there's um, RNA factors, right, that might regulate gene activity. Not even thinking about that, just talk about the genes we can predict, excuse me, the proteins that are predicted, we know they are present in E. coli and we have no clue what they are doing. And so this is the best understood organism on the planet, right, that has been studied for 200 plus years, maybe 150 plus years. And so there's this famous quote from the biochemist Jacques Monod, who said that biochemistry is universal. What is true of E. coli is true for an elephant, okay? And so what this means is if we do not understand what at least 70% of the proteins that we know are in E. coli are doing, 
you can, I guess, extrapolate what this means for organisms that are as diverse from E. coli as, you know, a sunflower is from a blue whale. Every new DNA sequence you look at will contain new protein sequences that you've never seen before or proteins that you do not know what they're doing. And it is this, what is sometimes termed genetic dark matter that is really the problem in the field, right? This is a problem that is inherent to all these studies. It doesn't, it doesn't help you to sequence more and more and more and more. You need biochemists to figure out what these proteins are actually doing. And that new knowledge will then inform and give you new interpretations of what the organisms are capable of. To go over, maybe you don't care about E. coli, maybe you only care about the human. Let's talk about the human um, body. There, the problem is even more problematic, right? If you look into the human genome, we have no clue what 98% of the human genome is for. 2% of the human genome encode about 25-ish thousand proteins, maybe it's 27,000 now, something like that. Um, there is a lot of um, structural or you know, gene expression um, RNAs that are you know, involved in regulating gene activity. Then there's a lot of retroviruses that we just you know, carry around in our genome. And the other 98%, we have no freaking clue what it's for. Okay, so if you sequence the human genome, which you know we, we all care about, and we think we have a pretty good understanding about human anatomy and human physiology, that is not true for human genetics. And so, you know, similar problems apply if we wildly sequence, find new organisms as diverse as Marin just showed before in this phylogenetic tree of life that we all are interested in, and you know how they partake in you know human health or in ecosystem functioning. And just sequencing is not necessarily the best way to approach this. Sequencing gives you hypotheses that can be tested in the lab. It's not, it should never be, you know, a study on its own. It should be complemented with other technologies and other ways of approaching the problems. Another problem in the field, and this is particularly true for the 16S RRNA gene amplicon studies that Marin just talked before, and I think he will cover a little bit more in detail about the technical details later, is that very often some people think that low abundance of an organism in a sample means that it's low importance. And this is a fundamentally flawed concept that should be self-evident. If I go to the Serengeti um, and I count species, I see that there's way more insects than gazelles. And I see there's way less hyenas than gazelles. There's even less lions than hyenas, and there's even less cheetahs than all the other organisms. That does not mean that the cheetah is irrelevant for ecosystem functioning. In fact, the opposite is true. If I kill every single cheetah in the Serengeti, the entire ecosystem will collapse because they're the top predators. They are the lowest abundant member of the community but they're absolutely essential for ecosystem functioning. And so to give you two examples of why this is a problem for this, this, this way of thinking, low abundance equals low importance is, 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 is really problematic, is I just want to highlight these two studies. So in one study, um, you know, researchers looked at which microorganisms, bacteria are here and fungi, you know, how they interact with the rhizosphere. So with the roots basically of plants and how nutrient exchange is happening. And what they found is that about 91% of all these microplant interactions in the rhizosphere are run by bacteria that are less than 0.1 relative abundance. And so, you know, this seems like a random fact, but it is important to point out usually in many, many microbial diversity studies, this cutoff of 0.1% is considered, you know, this is the important threshold. This is the cutoff that people use. This has something to do with the concept of how we approach the studies and with some technical issues, basically, of how the sequencing analysis are run. But so 91% of all these interactions are done by organisms that have low abundance. So if you make an artificial cutoff, I'm only going to look at organisms that are more than 0.1 abundance. In this particular case, you would miss 91% of all the relevant interactions. An even more incredible finding was um, what, you know, some people have called the rare biosphere organisms. So these are really, really rare organisms that are really hard to detect, actually. They are sometimes considered noise in many microbial diversity studies. And this is one of my most favorite microbial ecology papers that I ever read, which showed that a bacterium, a member of the delta proteobacterial, that makes up 0.006%, so six in 
100,000, right, in the 16S RNA gene amplicon libraries that drives virtually all of the sulfate reduction in this particular ecosystem of peatland. So you might care about peatlands or not. I don't know. I care about peatlands. I think they're pretty cool. Everything that is stinky is cool, in my opinion. But you know, sulfate reduction is absolutely essential to human health. There's many sulfate reducers um, in the mouth, for example, but also in the gut. Sulfate reduction is one of the most important contributors to corrosion, for example, in oil pipes. So it's a huge, huge problem in, in the industry as well, right? And so here you learn that an organism that I think most of us would not consider to be of potential relevance if we look at these 16S libraries, sometimes you wouldn't even detect those, is running virtually all, I think it was 91%, 92%, something like that, of all this one particular metabolic pathway in this ecosystem that is foundational to the entire ecosystem functioning. The other thing that we do not capture with near DNA sequencing analysis is that organisms have activity patterns. So again, I go back to the Serengeti. Um, we know that certain organisms right, are active during the day and some organisms are active in the night and some might be just dormant for a certain amount of time. So the equivalence, you know, in microbial ecology would be, you know, spore formers, for example, right? Dormant forms of cells that are simply there to withstand um, particularly adverse conditions at a particular time. They go dormant for years, decades, hundreds, thousands of years sometimes um, until they wake up again, quote unquote, because the conditions change for better. So this is something that is for zoology, right? This is obvious. This is self-evident. And it is very easy to forget that the same concepts apply to microbial ecology, to microbial ecosystems. Again, the easiest example for this is simple diurnal cycling. There's light during the day and it's dark during the night. That is, that is very obvious, right? But if we only focus on DNA sequencing rather than conduct additional analysis to inform when these DNA sequences are actually expressed, when the sequences are actually being used and actually contribute to growth of the organisms, they are, you know, they, they can be meaningless. And so what this means is the presence of the gene is not informative because it doesn't tell you whether it's expressed or not. And I think most of you are aware of the fact, right, that the simple presence of a gene doesn't mean it's expressed as an mRNA. The important thing, however, is very often we stop there. And the reason for that is it's easy to sequence nucleotide sequences. It's easy to do DNA sequencing. It's easy to do RNA sequencing as compared to, let's say, protein sequencing or metabolomics, where we look at all the different chemicals that are present in microbial cells. But simply because the mRNA is present doesn't mean the protein is actually translated. The fact that you observe a protein doesn't mean it's a catalytic, catalytically active enzyme. You do not know from the mere detection of a protein sequence whether the enzyme is actually catalytically active at a given time. Maybe the substrate is not present. Metal, maybe the metal cofactor that is present, right, is absence. And even if the enzyme is catalytically active, it doesn't necessarily mean that this will you know, yield to an increase in biomass, that the organism is actually growing. And so the point I'm trying to make here is not you know, to put you all down, <laughs> that you know, everything is inherently flawed. The point is one approach alone is not sufficient. You need to combine different analysis. Each one has particular flaws. Each one has particular benefits. And if we combine them together, we can really unravel the true biology um, of these systems. The last thing I wanna talk about, and this somehow loops back to what Marion talked about before about the human microbiome, is that it, it is very easy that we, you know, we, we try to fool ourselves to see causation where there is none. The co-occurrence of organisms doesn't mean they correlate. And even if you know, two particular gene sequences or two particular organisms are always present together, doesn't mean that this is a causal relationship. One of the most beautiful examples that was given to me when I was an undergrad in my statistics class was this famous example of a sociology um, study done in the 1980s or something like that in Brazil that looked at the correlation between the crime rate and the number of Catholic priests. So this data is just made up to represent this kind of data. This is not actual data. But basically what they found is there's a very strong correlation between the number of Catholic priests in a particular county in Brazil and the crime rates. 
And this led the people, sadly, <laughs> to, to, to you know, suggest that there might be an influence of Catholic priests on the crime rate. Okay. Obviously, the reason is not that there is a causative relationship that Catholic priests are more, uh, you know, engage more in criminal activity than other people. It has simply to do with the fact that um, in the favelas, there's a higher number, you know, low income people typically have higher attendance of, in churches, which means there's a higher number of Catholic priests, which means lower income counties had a higher population of Catholic priests. And those are also the ones that had a higher crime rate. So yes, there's a correlation between those, but there is absolutely no causative relationship between the two. And so again, I bring this very simple example that is self-evident, okay, this, I mean, this is obviously wrong, right? But we need to be very careful when we apply this thinking about correlation, co-occurrence and causation when we talk about microbial life. And in my opinion, no, in, in no other subfield in microbiology, this problem is more evident than in the human microbiome. The human microbiome field is extremely overhyped, extremely overhyped. And very often this is not due to, you know, the scientists themselves, but the associated PR um, and press release departments in the respective universities and the public press. Um, when you read these stories, you know, in newspapers and so on, always keep in mind there's a reason the newspaper is reporting on that, and that is it's to generate clicks. It is very important to keep that in mind. And so I want to, you know, just get a few things out of the way before I hand this back over to, to, to Marin. And one of the first things is that there's only actually a very small number of studies on the human microbiome that were focusing on causation rather than correlation that were done in a, statistic, in a statistically and scientifically sound way. The number of studies that simply focused on correlation versus causation is probably a thousand times larger than that that focus on causation. And unfortunately, in, you know, in the public mind, this is not the case. At, the, at this point, it seems that the human microbiome is blamed for everything. You know, the human microbiome is, uh, in, uh, you know, is, um, is the reason why, why some people are obese. The human microbiome is the reason some people are angry. The human microbiome, and so on. None of that, or a very small number of these claims are based at any factual data. They're simply extrapolation from correlative data. The other thing that to keep in mind is that, you know, we speak often about human microbiome. Um, the fact, however, is that most of these studies were not done in humans simply because there's, you know, we, we cannot do some of these studies on humans. We have to use mouse models or pig models or animal models for that. And it's yet unclear whether some of these results can be extrapolated to humans. Just because it is true in a mouse study, even if it's a causative relationship that is found, doesn't necessarily mean this is also true for humans. Yes, mouse are to a certain extent, very good models for, you know, the intersection of the gastrointestinal tract and the, you know, the brain, um, but, we don't, you know, we first need to repeat these studies also in humans. The other fact is, and this is something that really upsets me, is that the majority of gut microbiome studies are not gut microbiome studies. They are fecal samples that are being looked at. So when people, when you read, oh, a gut microbiome study has been done, the first thing you need to do is to look up, did they actually study the gut? Did they literally do an endoscopy pulled out epithelial tissue from the gut and looked at the mucus layer, or did they look at the fecal sample? I can guarantee you that in 99.9% .9 of the studies, they looked at fecal samples. And the problem with that is we know that stool samples are not, I repeat, they are not representative for the gastrointestinal tract. And the reason for that should be self-evident. If it passes out of the system through stool, this is not an organism that wants to stick around and interact with the epithelial layer. It doesn't mean that the organisms in the stool are not important in the gut. It just means it is a minor representation of all the organisms that are relevant in the system. And the ones who really stick around in the mucus layer will never pass out in the stool sample. So we have a flawed view of what is actually important in the gut simply due to the fact that we cannot give a thousand people endoscopies. We just can't. It's easy to collect a thousand stool samples, but we cannot give 1000 people an endoscopy, right? The other one is that there, you know, there are these sequencing kits 
I, I, I Googled this yesterday evening when I, when I put these slides together, and it's amazing how many companies, you know, offer this, you know, they send you a little packet, which basically is a cotton stick, which costs, you know, 0 0.01 dollars, basically. You send it in after swiping your stool sample after you pooped, right? And then they tell you, they claim to find out which food and supplements are best for you. This is a direct quote that I took from the website of one of the um, companies that offer that service called Sun Genomics. At very best, this is false advertising. At very best. It's basically just a waste of your money. Unless you already are a high risk patient. So there's a caution for here, right? I'm talking here about healthy people who just want to, you know, learn something about their gut. I'm not talking about people who, you know, have problems like Crohn's disease or diarrhea or something like that. For those people, this analysis absolutely makes sense and they should do this. I'm talking about healthy people. For healthy people who want to find out which food and supplements are best for you, at the very best, this is a waste of money. And sometimes you make conclusion based on flawed data that might actually be problematic and that would interfere with your actual health because you take something that is actually not good for you. One other thing that came out in the last couple of years is that people try to find a microbiome for everything. Earlier this year, there was the tumor microbiome. There was the brain placenta and the brain microbiome. There's a typo, sorry for that. The brain microbiome and the placenta microbiome. All of these studies were methodologically severely flawed. Okay. The brain and the placenta, as far as we can tell at the moment, are, are, are virtually sterile. And the last one is, if you go into a supermarket and you look into you know, your milk and your cheese and your yogurt section, I can guarantee you pretty much in every country these days, you can find you know, probiotic yogurt and probiotic drinks and so on. I am not aware of any study that demonstrated any effect, positive or negative, from probiotics on healthy people. Again, they are a waste of your money. Again, that doesn't mean they don't help. They, clearly, clearly help if you are already in a disease state. If you have problems with diarrhea, yes, it absolutely helps to take probiotics to re-establish a healthy gut microbiome. I'm talking about healthy people that do not have a disease state, okay? Um, and so again, the reason for that is that very often the, the reason for these claims is number one is an overhype of the data, often not by the scientists, but by companies who just, you know, they are in there to make a money, basically by fooling people into believing that their products actually work, which at the very best is false advertising. And because sometimes correlation is taken for causation, which sometimes might be the case, but very often we just don't know yet enough about the system. Excuse me. And so with these cautionary tales, um, I, you know, I want to hand it back to Maren. Again, I want to re-emphasize the importance is that we couple DNA analysis with other methodologies. DNA sequencing is a fantastic, wonderful tool that can reveal the biology of organisms that we yet do not know about or that we want to learn more about because they are important for human health, for ecosystem functioning, and so on. But they need to be coupled with other analysis, and you need additional data to help interpret your results. Roland, before you give this back to Marin, there's a question uh, mm -hmm. that was coming from the section when you were talking about the uh, abund low bacteria abundance. Um, so obviously they could be very important, but how do you avoid giving them erroneous important because the small changes in their abundance could be due to sequencing error or, or other issues with your methodology? Um, um... I'm not sure I understood the question. How, how do you go? Uh, I mean, the short answer is you need to do more analysis. You cannot just do 16S RNA diversity analysis. Ideal case scenario, you have time resolution, right? So that you don't look at a single time point, but look at the microbial community over time under different conditions and so on. I think where the question is going, if I interpret this correctly, what do you do if an organism is of very low abundance but in another sample taken at a later point, it is of a, a slightly higher abundance. And then, although the change in absolute numbers is very low, the relative change is very high. That, that's how I interpret this, this question. 
And the answer is you need to do more than one sequencing analysis. You need to do this in triplicate, for example. You need to do this over time, several time points. And most importantly, ideally, you know, the studies are coupled to additional analysis. So for example, if this is an organism that you think might be important for X, study X, right? If you find that there is the sulfur reducer that you know, at one time point is 0.1% and the next one is 1%, that's a tenfold change. And if your statistical analysis shows you, okay, this is it's indeed a statistical significant change, you might invest additional time into looking more into the diversity of the sulfate reducer community specifically, or analyze whether the sulfate reducing, the sulfate reduction rate of the system changes over time. So to do additional molecular biological, molecular ecological, geochemical analysis to gain additional data specifically for the questions you care about. I hope that answered the question. Uh, well, they will let me know if it did not. Um, there was actually another question. Um, somebody wants you to comment on the methodological flaws in the brain placenta microbiome studies. Um, without going into details, the short answer is the contamination. Um, usually the contamination of virtually all, let, let me take one step back. The main problem with these studies is that you are inherently dealing with extremely low biomass samples. The lower the biomass to begin with, the higher the chance, the risk of contamination is. And in the brain and placenta studies, as well as some other studies that looked at low biomass ecosystems. So for example, spacecraft assembly rooms are a good example, super low biomass, super oligotrophic systems. If there is a small DNA contamination, you know, this is a really big problem. A single cell sometimes can make, a few cells can make a difference. And the problem is virtually all molecular biological kits that are used these days in order to amplify the sequences. So run the PCR, for example, do the barcoding, they are all contaminated. Usually in a regular microbial ecological study, it is not relevant because the DNA you use as an input from your sample vastly overwhelms the amount of contamination. But think about it this way. Let's say you do a DNA polymerase, you, you do a PCR amplification in your lab to analyze a stool sample that you're interested in. The problem is that the way the DNA polymerase that you use for, to, for running the PCR was heterologically expressed in, a, in, in an expression system because we need to make this DNA polymerase somehow. The, purification of that enzyme, when it's put into the kit, is not perfect. There is some carryover contaminating DNA that they cannot get completely rid of. The same is true for DNA extraction kits and so on. There's minor contaminations. Typically, the microbial diversity analysis software like Chime or Mother or so on, you know, th there are settings that you can make in order to filter those sequences out. The problem becomes is what do you do if those sequences that are contaminating are actually in your sample, which is true, for example, for human microbiome studies, because the typical contaminants from air and from you know, kits are bucaldaria and pseudomonas. Well, guess what? They are in your gut, right? So it becomes a slippery slope. You cannot easily filter those sequences out for some of us. I don't have a problem with that. I study hot springs. There's a very low chance that I have pseudomonas erogenosa in my hot spring, right? So, you know, I have an easy time in this particular case, right? Um, but it can get pretty problematic depending on the particular type of sample you're looking at. And this, the problem is more pronounced the, low the, mo the, the, the lower the biomass of your ecosystem is. Thank you, Roland. Um, I think we're getting close to the end of our time. So I, I will turn it back to Mary to see what he wants to do next. Thank you very much, Roland. Uh, it was great. Um, so, um, now, um, you guys can see this, right, Eva? All right. Now we, um, I wanted to make sure that, uh, th that was a lot of details, uh, and there are many more things to discuss from, uh, composite data to sampling strategies and what need to be, uh, uh, what, what we really need to be careful about. Uh, I hope, uh, following weeks, we'll have more uh, details into these uh, caveats uh, regarding the nature of the data we're working with and under what circumstances those uh, questions we're interested in.
cannot be answered by the data we are able to collect. So uh, thank you very much, Roland, for this, uh, this excellent summary of, uh, of uh, potential bottlenecks uh, from the get-go. Uh, as, as Roland mentioned, uh, of course, there is no way of doing the science perfect. And um, you will hear these things much more frequently from perhaps early career scientists who are always more concerned about uh, uh, th these, these kinds of things. And you will disproportionately uh, less frequently hear uh, these kinds of concerns from uh, perhaps established people. But um, uh, the, the reality is we never work with perfect data. It is important to keep in mind that, uh, uh, that there are going to be caveats. And one of, I think, uh, uh, one of the most important thing to uh, do is to try to identify those, those potential caveats beforehand. That's why, for instance, the, the, purpose, the, the purpose of the seminar series is to introduce key concepts. So we will have a lot of time to think about how many different ways things can go wrong and, uh, and why should you pay attention to certain aspects of your data and uh, uh, when you're thinking about the, the, the very uh, core principles that, that help you uh, um, uh, uh, use various omics tools and strategies. So this is all the time we have, uh, I think. We have another perhaps 10 minutes to uh, answer more questions uh, and uh, yet we need to finish at some point. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank you very much before we go into questions uh, for your time, for your attention. Uh, uh, I know here we are, uh, uh, there are 18 time zones. I know for some of you, it was very early in the morning and some of you very late in the uh, evening. Um, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, and I hope this was somewhat uh, useful in, uh, to you and you will consider coming to the following weeks. And I would like to thank to the members of my group who have always been very supportive and uh, helpful uh, with this entire um, event. And I'd like to thank those who contribute to our science um, and uh, with that, I would like to finish here.